Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Jacek Bartosiak. Welcome to Strategy in Future. And today is my favorite guest, as you know well, uh, Hugh White from uh, Australia. And of course, we will be talking about Australia, submarines, Afghanistan. Hello, Hugh. How are you? I'm very well, Jacek. How are you? Great to be with you again. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, the morning in Warsaw, the, the afternoon in Canberra, uh, uh, but we are connected via technology. That matters. Uh, tell me, what is the mood in Australia after Afghanistan and whether Afghanistan had an impact of, on Morrison's decision to move with the submarine deal? Well, I think um, uh, the Afghanistan uh, debacle, I think you might call it, in those very, um, very difficult and in some ways tragic scenes at Kabul airport and so on, the unexpected speed with which uh, the Kabul government fell to the Taliban uh, has had a pretty big impact in Australia. Uh, as elsewhere in the world, I think it's shaken people's confidence in both the competence uh, of the Biden administration in the way they managed it and more broadly in the resolve of the US uh, government and you might even say the US as a nation to fulfil the kind of role globally uh, that uh, we've all relied on it to play for so long. So it, it had a, a, a pretty big impact here. Um, and, of course, that issue comes home uh, to Australia very much because uh, we feel ourselves to be so much in the front line of the other big contest, which is underway at the moment, of course, between the US and China. And we're very, there's a strong focus in Australia about how the US is conducting itself in that. And that, of course, uh, brings us to the other issue you mentioned, and that is Australia's rather spectacular recent decision to abandon its uh, contract to buy 12 conventionally powered submarines uh, from the French Naval Group uh, in favour of cooperating with the US and the UK to acquire nuclear powered submarines. I would say those issues are not directly connected. I think the roots of the decision on nuclear powered submarines and uh, the closer uh, strategic connection between the US and the UK, which, uh, which that decision on the submarines is embedded within, I would say that has deeper roots that goes further back. Um, but it does it does reflect the, the you know the really fundamental questions Australia is wrestling with about how it positions itself, how it uh, secures itself in an Asia where the a country as powerful as China is seeking really to overturn the US led order in the region and um, and replace it with a Chinese led order. And you could say the great uh, almost existential question for Australia is how we adjust our position. Um, in the face of that challenge. And, um, and I think the future historians will look back on the decision on the submarine as a very um, significant index indicator of where Australia is going. And I guess the way I'd summarise the relationship between the Afghanistan issue and the submarine issue is that the Afghanistan issue raised, again, concerns about America's resolve, not just resolve in South Asia, but also resolve in... In, uh, in East Asia, but the submarine decision reaffirmed that notwithstanding those doubts about US resolve, Australia is absolutely committed, at least under the present government, to um, backing the United States all the way as it tries to manage China's rise. Yeah, and, and based on your books, uh, including the, the, the famous book, How to Defend Australia, uh, what is your assessment of Morrison's decision at this stage? At this stage, uh, and let yes. me let me share with my concerns, uh, which are maybe too shallow, uh, given the fact that I'm in Poland, you're in Australia. I'm not deep in the you know discussion, strategy discussion uh, of your country, but it seems that Morrison sort of signed the uh, uh, check without potentially seeing the benefits of it long term maybe there is some you know uh, hidden agenda uh, that uh, made him do it at this stage uh, uh, would you elaborate on that because if you take benefits and, and costs at potential risks uh, it might maybe it could have been handled uh, more in a more you know sort of professional not professional but more sophisticated, more refined yes. ways, right? <laughs> That's very nicely put. Look, um, I think there's a couple of issues to, to unpack there. Um, so let's look at it in three different levels. 
The first is the level of what you might call uh, diplomacy, and you might even say good manners. I don't think anyone will doubt that uh, the management of the process as a piece of diplomacy, particularly in relation to France, was very poorly done. Uh, there really is no excuse for treating a country as significant and, you know, for Australia's point of view, as friendly as France, uh, with the discourtesy uh, that, uh, that was shown. And I think the historians will have an interesting time unpacking how and why that happened, but I don't I think there's, there's no question about that. But, but there are the two other levels, somewhat deeper levels of analysis, I think, require attention. The first is the operational question. The question, is it the right thing for Australia to move from uh, the French um, project to acquire conventionally powered submarines to a cooperation with the US and the UK to acquire uh, nuclear powered submarines? Um, that, I think, you know, my short, shorthand on this was that the, that the old project to acquire conventionally powered submarines with France was in very bad shape. It was badly conceived by Australia, badly managed by Australia, uh, and was likely to produce a very expensive submarine, literally something like twice as expensive as comparable submarines elsewhere would, would have acquired elsewhere would have been, um, with very high levels of technical risk and very long delays, extremely long delays. Um, and so for, for all of those reasons, I have in the Australian debate always been or uh, long been a very strong critic of the of the project as it was, not because I have any reservation about French submarines, because I just think we, we specified the wrong kind of submarine and we we're going about buying it in the wrong kind of way. Um, but I do think the nuclear option is worse for Australia. Uh, nuclear submarines are even more expensive. It's going to take even longer to bring them into service. So we'll have even fewer of them, whereas I believe we need a large submarine service. And I don't think the operational benefits of nuclear power, significant though they are, outweigh the disadvantages of schedule, cost and risk. There'll be a huge challenge for Australia uh, to learn how to operate and maintain these nuclear powered submarines. We have very little nuclear engineering expertise in Australia. We have no nuclear power plants, for example. We mine a lot of uranium, but we don't do very much with it. So I think um, as a capability choice, I think it was a very serious mistake. And then there's the strategic question, because, of course, that capability question, the decision to acquire this particular kind of submarine in this kind of way, is nested within uh, the much broader concept of Australia increasingly aligning itself, drawing itself closer and closer, both to the US and to the UK, as the solution to what you might call Australia's China problem. That is the problem that we are living in a region with a very powerful state, eventually important to us economically, but very different from us ideologically and with and seemingly with uh, with a, the, the ambition to exercise undue levels of influence you might even say hegemony over our part of the world now i, I think I, I think that there too there are some very significant um, uh, mistakes in this in this strategy um, i think let me deal with the uk aspect of it first because one of the peculiarities of this is that it's as the awkward uh, acronym that's been a quite, that been developed, AUKUS, A U K U S, Australia, United Kingdom, United States. As that acronym suggests, the UK is right at the heart of this, and it's likely, not certain, but likely that we're going to end up acquiring the British submarine, the something either the astute class uh, uh, SSN or a variant of that. And so this Britain's right at the heart of this. And you might say at one level, those anyone who knows a little bit of our history will know that we were originally founded as a European settlement in Australia by the British in 1788, and we're English speaking, and you know, we have very close links with Britain, uh, and we we're part of the British Empire. But we've had no no deep strategic relationship with Britain since at the very latest, the end of the 1960s, when Britain withdrew from Asia, their famous East of Suez withdrawal. And so it's, it's 50 years since we regarded Britain as an ally. So one of the peculiarities is that suddenly, and partly because of Brexit, the UK is talking about its re-emergence as an Asia-Pacific or an Indo-Pacific power. And we can see this demonstrated by the dispatch of the Queen, HMS, HMS Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier to our part of the world at the moment. Now, I've just got to say, uh, with all due respect to my many friends in Europe, uh, this is a fantasy. Britain is not going to be a significant strategic player in the Western Pacific in the decades to come. It just doesn't have anything like the power. So, so I think it's a big mistake for Australia to 
to give Britain a central position in our strategy for dealing with China. It's not going to be there for us any more than in the end it was there for us when we had a problem with the Japanese after 1941. That leads me to the Americans. I'm sorry, I'm giving you a long answer. That's perfect. I, I, love, I love it. So, you know. <laughs> uh, but, but, so the real question, you know, that right at the heart of it is, you know, does it make sense for Australia to embed itself even more closely than we already are in America's approach to dealing with the China problem? And that depends, of course, a lot on how effective we think America's approach to dealing with the China problem is. Uh, and, and I am about that, as you would know from our discussions and indeed from, uh, from, from the book that you mentioned, How to Defend Australia, I am a sceptic about the effectiveness of US strategy towards China in the Western Pacific. It's clear, it was clear in the latter phases of the Trump administration, uh, it's been clear so far in the Biden administration, that there's a great rhetorical, and you might even say emotional commitment in Washington, to the idea of pushing back against China, resisting China's challenge, trying to contain China and, and um, preserve the US-led order in Asia. But, but I've got to say, I am very skeptical that, uh, the, that uh, the US is going about that in an effective way. Uh, I don't think we're seeing anything like the scale of effort in Asia that's required to effectively push back against China. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of rhetoric, but not much real action, uh, particularly when you measure the, the, what America has actually done and is doing and is planning to do against the scale of China's challenge. China is the most formidable adversary that the United States has ever faced. It's even more formidable than the Soviet Union on one, perhaps the most critical dimension, that is its economy is bigger. Uh, it's a, it's an, a, you know, it's a, it is the, you know, the first country that America is confronted with an economy of comparable size to it, to America's own. And the scale of effort that the United States is pushing in is nothing like big enough. And so I therefore think there's a real question as to whether the United States in the longer term is going to succeed in pushing back against China. And there's therefore a real question as to whether Australia is sensible for Australia to embed itself even more deeply in that US, um, in that US effort. And, um, and one way of asking, thinking about that is to ask, you know, this simple question. Is the acquisition by Australia of eight nuclear powered submarines going to make a significant difference to America's capacity to contain China? For example, will it make a significant difference to deterring a Chinese um, move, um, armed move against Taiwan? And if it doesn't make a difference to deter, if it doesn't to deter it, will it make a difference to America's capacity to defeat it in a war if deterrence fails? And I think the answer is very clearly no. Um, the scale of the, of the forces that would be brought to bear in a maritime conflict over Taiwan are so vast uh, that, um, uh, that actually the submarines, an additional eight submarines doesn't make that much difference. There's also a deeper question. Don't want to go too far into this level of, of detail, but I think it's also a misunderstanding of the nature of the operational dynamics of the US-China war over Taiwan to think the submarines actually make much difference. Um, because America's challenge, is, you know, submarines are primarily a sea denial weapon. America's challenge in uh, a, a war in the South China Sea or the East China Sea or over Ta in Taiwan Strait is, is not to deny the, 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 the ocean to the Chinese. It's to seize control of the ocean for themselves. Now, those extra submarines, if they were added to the US order of battle, might make it somewhat easier for the US to, to sink more Chinese submarines. But that doesn't, frankly, solve America's problem because there's still an awful lot of other ways in which the Chinese can sink American ships. So I, I actually think it's, 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 not, it's, not a, it's, it's not a credible contribution to the US strategy, and I have broader reservations about the quality of the US strategy. The last point to make is that I do think that um, what Australia has done is, is additionally to make it very hard to resist further enmeshment in the US strategic position. Uh, one of the things about Australia that's important to remember, particularly when viewed from a European... And, enmeshment, and enmeshment, meaning embedment. Enmeshment, yes. yeah. embedment, mm -hmm. that's right, sort of, you know, integration. <clears throat> one of the things to remember about Australia, um, particularly, as I say, viewed from a European NATO perspective, is that although we have this very, this emotionally very close alliance with the United States, and so we talk a lot about our shared history, culture, values, and all that sort of stuff, um, actually, there's not that much actual operational integration, certainly not compared to NATO. Uh, 
On Australian defence, Spain are looking at the way in which NATO has these very deep, highly institutionalised integration, integrated uh, logistics, operational planning, and so on. Um, really, our, our ANZUS alliance with the United States has very little of that. But what we should expect as the US-China contest grows and intensifies, escalates, we should expect the United States to increasingly look to integrate Australia more and more closely into US uh, military planning against China and increasingly um, uh, solidify what is at the moment a pretty vague political level commitment, for example, to support the United States over in a conflict over Taiwan into something much closer and more binding, more like NATO. And one way in which I think we should expect that to happen is the US will increasingly look to base forces in Australia, which is not something it's done very much of before. So even today, we have only, you know, we have a, a small rotational deployment of Marines to Northern Australia, but it's not at all a not, not by NATO standards, it's not a substantial deployment. And we should also expect the US um, to start seeking Australia, because we are a long way from China, Australia forward deploying our forces uh, alongside US forces to bases closer to the area of operations in, um, in the Chinese littoral. And so I think we'll find ourselves increasingly drawn into um, the, the US <coughs> military preparations for a war with China, which will make it very hard for us to avoid going to war. And the last point to make about that is quite simply this. I don't believe the United States can win a war with China over Taiwan, for example. Uh, in fact, I don't know what winning a war with China really means on an issue of that significance. I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't believe, I've seen no evidence that the US has a concept which gives anyone a high level of confidence that can impose enough pressure on China in a war in China's own backyard, which would make the Chinese back off over an issue as important as Taiwan. And I think it's a very bad idea for Australia to increasingly base its position in Asia on an ever closer integration with US plans for a war with China, which I think are unlikely to produce a victory. Uh, call me old fashioned, but I think it's very important when you think about whether you're gonna join a war or not to ask yourself whether you think you're gonna win. True. You know, but judging from what you're saying, it's, it seems to be a major strategic uh, good move uh, by the US administration and a highly doubtful move by Australia. So well, I, 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 I think it's, you put it this way, you can see why it appeals to the United States. Whether it's a good move or not, it's a, it's a let me give, give you a, more, a better frame uh, answer. It's a good move within the strategy that the United States is now adopting. Which might be Whether wrong a, anyway. Yeah. But, the, but I think the strategy itself might be wrong anyway. It goes back to the point I touched on before. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think, even if it does somehow persuade Australia to, and even if Australia does end up acquiring eight um, nuclear-powered submarines, and even if we do commit them to supporting the United States in operations against China, um, and even if the US does base forces in Australia, and we do place full place our forces forward with US forces closer to the area of operations. None of that, I think, is going to make any difference to the fundamental operational calculus about who wins a war over Taiwan, for example. And, and so I think the US strategy is deeply flawed. And so I therefore don't, don't think it's a smart move for the United States in the broad strategic sense to, to, um, to, to double down on it. But viewed in Washington, where there seems to be implicit faith in this strategy, um, yes, I think they're probably pretty pleased with themselves. I think they, I think they regret uh, having mishandled the diplomacy with Paris so badly, but I think they probably think, I'm sure they think, that this is a very significant step forward in them developing a credible a posture, uh, putting flesh on the bones of their of their strategic contest with China. And, and I, I would sort of turn that against them and say that it's a measure of how weak the actual measures they've taken with things like the Quad, for example, how weak they are, that a, a project to provide Australia with, uh, with nuclear-powered submarines 25 years from now, mind you, I mean, the first of these boats will enter service with, a, in, with the Austra Royal Australian Navy on something like 25 years from now. And you know, one of the points <coughs> I make to my American friends is, uh, guys, this, this, this contest will be over by then. Exactly. I mean, the, long, if there is any war, it, it will have been, you know, the result. Will, well, I, either with a war or without it. By the, by the time we get to 2045 or 2046, 
when these when these submarines might enter service if we're lucky, then either America will have defeated China's challenge and pushed it back into its box, or China will have pushed the United States out of Asia, either with a war or without. Sure, that's right. And 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 you know the idea the idea that uh, that the whole contest is going to go on hold until Australia's ready for it, and it's just worth making the point. 2046 is when the first submarine comes into service. The eighth submarine doesn't come into service until sometime in the 2060s. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, well, it's ludicrous, actually. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me add two cents from Warsaw, although we are far away, how yes. we view it. First of all, it's, of course, we are concerned about this sort of uh, uh, slap in the face to France and continental yeah. Europe. And we are yeah. always afraid that the continental Europeans will not side with the world ocean and English speaking nations in this context yes. of between China and US. And we are then, you know, behind the continental, you know, yes. Western Europeans. And this is our concern that it is uh, breaking uh, NATO and its yes. political cohesion, meaning also the military cohesion, Article 5 and so on. And we yes. are waiting for the France response on many yes. fronts because the France will not leave it like that. I think they will be pushing for strategic autonomy of Europe, yes. continental yes. Europe and so on. And yes. how yes. to do The second thing is that operationally, we think it's uh, it's not a good choice for Australia, you know, based on also on your book. Uh, maybe it should have been 36 or 24 submarines mm. uh, protecting the sea, you know, making sure that sea denial is in, uh, working, uh, that the resources are, uh, and, and that you control the OD yes. loop, that you control those uh, missiles that will be on this uh, ship. And there are all those question marks that this is going to be an American nuclear power pack yes. your unit who's going to maintain so you will be yes. closely dependent upon the whole service and basically it will be a leverage against you and if you want so basically you're buying the stuff for the american power projection capabilities so right. you, exactly so you're paying them twice yeah <laughs> and it will be very much delayed i was yeah. thinking that maybe there is small print in the agreement that that is a sort of the uh, move towards uh, maybe long-term obtaining the nuclear capabilities on your own, right? That this is a sort of a softening of the of the U.S. side that maybe, given the the size of the challenge, the extent, the extent of the Chinese challenge, they will really enable proliferation, you know, towards the closest allies of the five eyes, world ocean allies. And this is maybe a symptom of the US, new US grand strategy that, okay, we're shortening the front in Eurasia, continental Eurasia, even a little bit jettisoning NATO, and we will focus on world ocean, maybe new space capability, space and new mm -hmm. world ocean. And this is our new front line, right? And we will not only embolden, but also strengthen our allies uh, like Australia, also by providing this sort of you know, capabilities, which Americans have never done, by the way, right? They didn't. Yes, yes. They, and strategically, it's like uh, we, we think that uh, this is a good move for the U.S. because it shows that uh, Australia is already at this stage on the U.S. side with all those consequences that you <clears throat> very well outlined and also potentially with commercial consequences for Australia. If China is going to play hardball to, to punish you for that, you, you will yeah. be the victim. And we were watching yeah. the commercial trends and the United States yes. didn't, didn't compensate you for taking a front, a front fight with uh, China. So I'm wondering uh, what are the reasoning behind Morrison's decision? How, what is the strategic culture in, in Australia? How are those decisions made in Canberra? Yeah. Yeah. How does it's that work? A really, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, Look, let me just uh, make a point about the nuclear proliferation issue that you've touched on and, and also a point about the continental versus world, world ocean thing before I answer your question about, the, about what's going on mm -hmm. here. Um, I, I'm, I'm very confident, or perhaps I take it for granted, but I'm pretty sure I'm right, uh, that there is nothing in the kinds of understanding which have been reached around provision of a nuclear-propelled submarine um, to Australia uh, concerning an eventual provision of nuclear weapons capability. Uh, all three ministers, all three leaders, when they made the announcement, stressed that, and I, I, I'm, 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 my instinct is that that's right. 
but I do think it is nonetheless relevant to the question of future proliferation because today one would perhaps say that it would be unthinkable for the US or the UK to provide nuclear weapons to Australia. But the fact is, until quite recently, it was unthinkable that the US and the UK would provide nuclear propulsion technology for, to Australia. And what they've, what they've done is decided the strategic circumstances in, in, in Asia are now so challenging that uh, they should break a long-standing policy in order to, in order to provide this. Um, now, I do... I, so I think it's, it, it makes it not more likely, but if I can put it this way, less unthinkable that the US or the UK might one day, not this week or next week, but in decades to come, uh, provide uh, Australia with a nuclear weapons capability. And of course, having nuclear powered submarines does help, that is a step towards a submarine basing option for, for nuclear weapons. So I, 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 don't, I wouldn't want to overemphasize that. I, I think it's kind of a theoretical observation, but I think it's nonetheless a significant one. The second point to make, and just to pick up on your point about the contrast between the sort of world ocean Anglo-Saxon powers and the continental European powers. And this is perhaps a little impertinent of me coming from such a merit, such as from so far away and such a maritime strategic perception. But, but it does seem to me that, um, you know, for Europe, China is strategically primarily a continental problem. And, and therefore Russia is central to it. That you know, for, for all the complexities of uh, of uh, Europe's relationships with Russia, um, and Poland's relationship with Russia, in in the end, the country which will guarantee that the Chinese will never establish hegemony over the world island is Russia. Sure. Um, and 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 that's you know that's that's sort of Russia's destiny in, in life. Um, uh, so I I think it, it's some. Um, you know, I think that the, the, the future China-Russia relationship is a te te terribly, sig terribly significant one, including significant to Europe. Um, and if I can put it this way in slightly schematic terms, the stronger China becomes, the more important it will be for Europe that Russia is strong enough to, to prevent it moving from being a dominant power in East Asia, which I think it will become, to being a dominant power in uh in, in across the Eurasian um, uh, landmass. So, on your question about um, uh, about uh, uh, what's the reasoning in Australia? Look, it's it's hard to answer that without appearing a little disloyal to my fellow countrymen, and for that matter, to my friends and former colleagues working in the Australian government, because I think the answer is that there's a lot of simplicity and naivety in the thinking that we're seeing here. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind that Australia has been for a very long time a very secure country. Uh, since 1972, roughly speaking, when Nixon went to, went to Beijing, um, and which is when the Cold War in Asia really stopped, um, we have been a very close ally of the uncontested dominant power in our part of the world. And so we have felt very secure. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we've been, you might say that's the key reason why we've been such a strong US ally, because uh, American primacy in our part of the world has been uncontested and enormously beneficial. Um, so now we face a new situation. And in a sense, not just new since 1972, but in some ways new since first European settlement in 1788. Because as we confront China, we see that for the first time in our history since European settlement, that there is an Asian power which is as rich or richer and therefore as powerful or more powerful than the dominant Anglo-Saxon power. Uh, First Britain, of course, was the dominant Anglo-Saxon power in the Western Pacific and now the United States. And so Australians do feel very insecure and we're not used to feeling insecure. And the natural thing to do for a country when it feels insecure is to reach back to what it knows, to reach back to what's familiar to it. And what's familiar to Australians is alliance dependent on our English speaking great power friends, Britain and America. And so I think the fact that this is a deal done not just with America, with Britain is, is psychologically very significant. Uh, uh, our prime minister, Scott Morrison in announcing the deal used repeatedly the phrase forever partnerships. That is partnerships that last forever. Well now, we all know that no partnerships in our business last forever. 
They last as long as interests and objectives align and converge. And, uh, uh, and in fact, our relations with both Britain and America have gone up and down a lot over their history and will continue to do so in future. But I think what you see there is a, is a psychological dependence based but produced by anxiety rather than a cold and rational assessment of Australia's um, actual interests and objectives. And a consequence of that is that as Asia becomes more complex and contested and more dangerous, Australia is less and less relying on interaction with our neighbours, working with other countries in Asia, and more and more on these remote powers. And the problem with that is that these remote powers have less and less capacity to influence what's happening in Asia. As China's maritime power grows, and it's worth bearing in mind, of course, going back to the point we were making before, neither America or Britain have ever been continental powers in Asia. They've always been maritime powers. Their capacity to influence strategic events there, going all the way back to the 18th, 17th century, has depended on their capacity to project power by sea. And that is what China is undermining. You know, the big strategic, military strategic development of recent decades has been the growth in China's capacity to prevent the United States or the United Kingdom, for that matter, or France, projecting power by sea into the Western Pacific. And, and that really seriously undermines their capacity to make an impact in our region and to protect our interests and their own at, at a time when we're depending more and more on them. So I think there's a, our, our nostalgia for uh, the old solutions, the ones that worked for us in the past, the ones that, that protected us from Imperial Japan, for example, in the Second World War, that's kind of psychologically understandable, but as a policy response in very changed circumstances, I think it's deeply mistaken. And the fact, the fact is, I mean, this is one of the problems. Uh, and again, I, you know, I'm reluctant to appear so critical of my, of my government and my fellows and my friends and colleagues in the business, but I, I do think Australia has a problem with lack of sophistication in this field. Um, we, we, have, we haven't always been like that. There was an era in which Australian uh, political leaders and senior officials were quite sophisticated in this kind of of, 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 of issues. Um, but we have a generation now of political leaders who are not just, who, who are in fact post-Cold War. They've, they've, they've grown up in the era after the Vietnam War. They've grown up entirely in this era of uncontested US primacy. They can hardly imagine a region in which America is not the uncontested dominant power, which is why it's so easy for them to assume that America will somehow defeat China and return us back to the old status quo that we liked so much. And, uh, you know, because Australia has been so secure, we have a generation of political leaders who've never really had to think very carefully about these things. And therefore they confront these challenges with a great deal of naivety. It's as if we were confronting the pandemic without a whole lot of, um, of uh, infectious diseases experts, um, of epidemiologists said so. Um, uh, I think one of the problems we have is that we, are, we lack the expertise effectively to assess uh, the challenges that we face. And uh, the last point I'd make is that there's also a kind of a nervousness. Um, Australia, because we've always had the luxury, very unusual, Australia has a very unusual history. We've always had the luxury of being a very close ally of the dominant global maritime power. And it's just an accident of history. We were established as part of the British Empire. For as long as the British Empire lasted, we had the privilege of being protected by our position in the British Empire. And when the British Empire collapsed, which effectively in Asia happened, well, lots of moments, but the sort of crunch point was the fall of Singapore in the, in the beginning of 1942. As soon as the British Empire collapsed, America took over. And so we have never confronted the world as a middle power or a small power, having to make its way without the very close protection of the world's most powerful maritime state. And so unlike, for example, the history of Poland or the history of any other European power that had a long history stretching back centuries of trying to make your way in a very difficult, complex power political jigsaw, we've never had to do that before. And, uh, and particularly the present generation has very little uh, political leaders, have very little sense of that. And so I think we're approaching it with a lot of naivety and a lot of nostalgia and a lot of fear and not much hard analysis.
Uh, so I will have the last question and uh, the, the, uh, touching on your book, How to Defend Australia. Uh, what would you write differently today, given uh, this events that have developed uh, and occurred since you wrote it? And also given this, uh, you know, full dedication to this nuclear submarines that will consume yeah. a lot of money, would yeah. you write it differently? Uh, because I understand um, your, 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 your dream was to properly feel the force and yes. make it a float that would be capable of uh, defending Australia. Yeah. Well, my, you know, the, the heart of the, of the argument in the how to defend Australia was that, Aus that we should no longer expect the United States to remain a significant player in Asia over the decades to come, and we therefore needed to, to examine how we would defend Australia independently without relying on the United States. And right at the heart of that, because we're an island, was preventing an adversary projecting power by sea against us, and right at the heart of that was submarines. And so, as you touched on before, my solution was that we should have a, a, a very big submarine force, 24 or 36 boats. Um, and, uh, and because it needed to be very big, they needed to be relatively inexpensive, and I'd, it never seemed to me that the additional cost and the other complications of running nuclear-powered submarines Uh, outweighed the operational advantage of nuclear power. Now, they do have operational advantages, particularly high speed, which gives you a lot of opportunities, which the slower conventionally powered boats don't have. But I think on balance, you get a bigger operational benefit from having a larger force of less capable boats than a smaller force of more capable boats. It's like the difference between uh, the German Panzer tank and the Russian T-34. Tank for tank, the Panzer was the better tank. But as, as Yukov said, uh, quantity has a quality all its own. So I wouldn't change that argument. I still think that Australia will be better off with a bigger force of, um, of uh, more simple submarines. And, and I would say that I'm not sure we won't end up going that way. I, I, I think that when the excitement of the present moment has died, and of course it's generated a lot of excitement in Australia, just as it has elsewhere, um, I, I, I think there's a fair chance that this whole project will fall uh, will fall apart. That the complexities, the costs, the uncertainties, the delays will mean that you know two years from now, five years from now, people wake up and think that realize that this is a really dumb idea, and we we do something else. Now that what that means is we'll have lost another five years. There'll be a, an, another very significant delay in the development of the submarine capability we need. That's a major problem for us. But I, I, I think it'd be better five. If, if we wake up five years from now, it would be better to scrap the old project, scrap the nuclear project, and go back to trying to build conventional submarines. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually change much in the book. I think the book was based on a pessimistic view of the um, prospects for the US maintaining its leading position in Asia, and I've seen nothing at all to um, to reduce my pessimism about that. On the contrary. I think my pessimism is even deeper now than it was. Fair enough uh, for our, uh, you know, viewers. Uh, it's a good moment to 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 to, to say that uh, you need, simply need to read and and, and make sure on your own whether uh, Hugh White is right or not, and <laughs> we'll see how it will unfold in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Hugh, for the conversation. It's a, great, it's a uh, great pleasure again. It's always great to talk to you. Yeah, likewise. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and stay with us at Strategy in Future for more episodes. Mm -hmm.